Resources. Um, one of his primary focuses is on developing and interpreting all of the coral reef survey data that's been collected and compiled for the last 25 years within the Division of Aquatic Resources and also helping us to develop um, integrated survey and monitoring techniques throughout the state. And his talk will reflect on some of this analysis. Okay, thank you. Um, so rotational management involves alternately opening and closing an area to protection. So the idea being that uh, if you close it for a number of years, resources can somewhat recover. We are not locking it away forever. And so it's, sort of people, it's possible to reap the benefits of the closure. And it's a kind of an appealing idea to a lot of people. And it's something that crops up all the time from bottom fish through to coral reefs. And it's really, it's a, it's a very pervasive idea. And uh, so I think that for that reason, it's extremely important that we look at uh, the one area in Hawaii where rotational closure has been uh, you know, um, tried. And that is the uh, Waikiki Diamond Head Fishery Management Area. So um, the Waikiki Diamond Head FMA established in 1978, it's rotationally closed. When initially it was on a four-year cycle, it was closed for two years, and then it was open for two years, with some restrictions on fishing in the first year of opening. In that, uh, and so this whole area in red was the original size of the FMA. It's two and a half kilometers, it extends out to 500 yards offshore. In 1988, uh, the management regime was changed, and uh, the sort of northern portion there was permanently closed, became the Waikiki Marine Life Conservation District, and the remainder uh, was kept to a two-year cycle, one year open, one year closed. So when it's originally established, the objectives, uh, as specified in the statute, which have created the FMA, were to preserve, protect, conserve, propagate, and manage marine life for the revitalization of public fishing grounds. So to me, there's sort of three components to that. There's a kind of conservation uh, protection element. There's a kind of sustaining future generations and, and new recruits, the propagation element there. And there's also an idea that it'll sort of sustain and improve fisheries. So I'm going to look at the evidence we have in all three of those areas. And a couple of caveats, very important ones. So, you know, Waikiki is a very poor quality habitat, especially now. Uh, it's a small area, it's about a kilometer squared, the whole, uh, whole size, it's, it's shallow habitat, very low velocity, uh, and then there's limited coral, particularly nowadays. It was uh, struck by Hurricane Aniki in 1992, and what's a very, very apparent to anybody uh, who ever goes there is that uh, it's become overgrown by uh, uh, Gorilla Ogo uh, since about the mid-1990s. And this, in the sort of bottom right picture there, it sort of carpets reef, fills in all those sort of little pukas and so on, very detrimental to fish life, and the sort of obvious effect of that is that beaches are covered in the, in the algae. But certainly now a very poor habitat, and it never was so great, probably. So, um, so that DAR, when it established the FMA, it was sort of actually quite forward-thinking at the time and fairly committed, and actually established quite a good marine survey program. And uh, there's actually a lot of work, a tremendous amount of work put in by uh, the AR people <coughs> over certainly the first 15 years or so, and then the program has continued through to 2002. So each of these years I have a, a lot of survey data, and I've sort of collated that information. I didn't gather any of it, I've just sort of worked with the data that's there to try and draw out the patterns. <coughs> so um, here we have sort of those two, I sort of group fish into two main types of fish. Fish that are prime targets that are sort of uh, sought after by fishermen, goldfish, parrotfish, jacks, and things like that, and then fish that are uh, less desirable uh, and sort of much less uh, preferred, small butterfly, small wrass, some of the small surgeon fish. And 
<laughs> look at the trends in biomass, the total fish biomass within these groups over time. From the first year we have data on the left, 1979 through to 2002. So the first thing that's very obvious is that fishery target species have done extremely poorly in the FMA. Uh, the most recent data we have, the biomass had dropped by about three quarters from the time the FMA was established. And what's also apparent is that you know, biomass dropped very rapidly, uh, consistently, almost from the time the FMA was established. So in terms of the fish that are not taken, there showed an initial increase. Conceivably, there was a reduction in competition or predation. Uh, and then sometime in the mid-1990s, uh, they sort of dropped back to a level approximately equivalent now, more recently, to where they were when the FMA was created. So um, when you look back at a data set like this, it's hard to know, you know what's driven that change. And, and as I say, things have changed within the FMA in terms of the habitat. And uh, so the first thing I'm looking at, I don't know how well this will come across, so hopefully it's fairly clear. But um, I sort of grouped it into change over the period of closure and opening. So green is when you're allowed to fish, and red is when you're, you're not allowed to fish. And so it's a fairly kind of clear uh, sawtooth pattern. Fish biomass recovering in periods of closure, and then decline when it's reopened. And the, the amount of the decline is almost always you know, large in comparison to the amount of the recovery. So the net effect is that fish biomass is sort of driven down. And that's very consistent with fishing having been a big part of this. It's not something that's sort of independently happening uh, just because of uh, declining habitat quality. <coughs> so um, the other thing, the two sort of really key events which have sort of degraded the habitat in the FMA are uh, Hurricane Aniki and uh, the overgrowth of the reefs of Grassl area. And both those things happened sort of sometime between 1990 and 1995. <coughs> and it's sort of very clear that basically the um, fishery target biomass was already heavily degraded by the time those events happened. They don't explain in any way why fish target biomass is so low now. It may perhaps be an explanation for why the, the non-fish groups have dropped in that time. So the bottom line is that across all fish groups, biomass is now about a third of what it was when the FMA was established. So looking at the sort of secondary objective, the thing about the propagation, uh, you know, are, does creating the FMA in any way sort of help to provide more fish recruits in other areas or even within the FMA itself? Is there that propagation element? And the key thing there is really how many big fish are there? They're the key breeders. The big old fish are just much more important breeders than small, you know, recently uh, mature fish. And so uh, what I've done here is look at the, uh, the sort of the biggest fish that you would see during a survey. And the survey is approximately a 40-minute snorkel uh, across one portion of the, of the FMA. And uh, so in, in the first year they were done, people tended to see a large fish. Uh, the 40, 50 centimeter surgeon fish were frequently seen through the 1980s. Parrot fish were frequently 50 centimeter plus fish. And then across all these uh, groups, uh, when um, all the target groups, there's been a very distinct decline. In the, and that's, that's very important in terms of the sort of breeding uh, potential of these areas. So I mean, the strongest decline, as I was pointing out there, is in parrot fish. And uh, just to give a sort of example of how things have changed, in, in all pre-1985 surveys, so there's 376 surveys in the FMA, a, large, a fish larger than 50 centimeter was seen about one third, of, was seen in 31% uh, you know, of those surveys. Post-1990, uh, out of 78 surveys, only three times it was seen. The parrotfish community has shifted from these large, heavy grazing, uh, big individuals, important breeders, to the small, you know, initial phase fish on the whole. It's a very dramatic ecosystem change. And um, because the uh, northern portion is fully permanently closed in 1988, we also have the opportunity to compare how permanent closure works in comparison to rotational closure in this sort of quite important uh, metric. So th this data here that I'm showing now is the data from the, within the FMA. It is also the area that was initially within the FMA, but in 1988, which is the way the vertical bar is, those areas became the MLCD and were permanently closed. So if you look at surgeon fish, prior to the, when the both areas were rotationally managed, the pattern was about the same. It was a sort of gradual decline. Subsequent to the creation of the MLCD, the, actual the number of big fish has actually increased in surgeon fish, possibly also in goat fish. Pattern rather more mixed than some of the other ones, but overall it is a very different picture within the reserves than compared to the rotationally managed one. And only the reserves are actually sustaining the number of these big fish. So as far as the third objective, that was about um, revitalizing public fishing. Um, this data comes from Carl Meyer's uh, PhD work, and uh, he conducted a large number of shoreline surveys of fishing effort within the Waikiki FMA between 1998 and 2001. And uh, so 
once again, try to compare EFMA with uh, areas that are open to fishing on the southeast of Hawaii. With anything in ecology, it's very difficult to find a perfect comparison. So he's looking at a general variety of areas somewhere in the vicinity and uh, looking at the amount of fishing effort he saw and how many fish were caught, what the total yield was. So in terms of the first number, CPV, catch per unit effort, uh, and then there's two locations there, the open area and the Waikiki FMA. So in, for both, the two main gears being used for spear and pull and line. And for both of those gears, the FMA has lower return on effort than actual areas that have no management whatsoever. Uh, and in terms of the, but, but the sort of the time of fishing that goes on is actually quite different. And that's because of a problem of trying to find a natural comparison. So the Waikiki FMA is sort of much more heavily spear fished. The great majority of catch is taken by spear. It has higher return per effort. And then the open area has a lot more pull on line fishing. So even though the actual return on effort is low in the FMA, because the, the amount of effort going into the most effective type of fishing, spear fishing is higher, the actual total catch from the FMA is a little bit higher than the open area, but it's by no means impressive. So, uh, and you know, another really important thing that's happened in the FMA is a kind of unintended consequence. And then this is, you know, what's called derby fishing. And that's a short-term spike of intensive fishing when an area becomes uh, open. And uh, to illustrate that, this comes from Carl Meyer's data. It's 460 shoreline patrols over approximately a three-year period. So normally when you walk the two and a half kilometers to the shoreline, you'd see no, nobody fishing, one person spear fishing, a couple. One time they saw 11 uh, on a normal period, sometime on the weekend or something like that, or public holiday. And then um, the one time they were there when the actual area had just been reopened to fishing on January, First year 2000, there's 82 pe people spear fishing in the water at that point. So there's a tremendous surge of people in the first week when it's opened. And effectively, what that means is you close an area for a year, fish become habituated to the idea they're not being fished, and suddenly you have an enormous stampede of people in the water at one time, and it's a sort of, you know, uh, quite enjoyable maybe for the for the people, but it, it's not a good form of resource management in my view. And uh, <coughs> so the second unintended consequence is that um, in all the time he was there, he witnessed 35 illegal spearfishing events over a 38 month period. And you know, more than half of them were in th that one week period, which just after the closure. And this enormous number of people in the water, very crowded. I inevitably, it's sort of meaning there's a kind of spillover effect of fishing. <laughs> and uh, you know, it probably weakens the effectiveness of the MLCD as well. So to summarize, you know, the Waikiki FMA was created to preserve, protect, conserve, propagate, and manage marine life for the revitalization of public fishing. So <coughs> well, it didn't preserve, protect, and conserve because target fish biomass dropped by three quarters. It certainly didn't propagate because large fish are almost totally absent from the area. And it's also very hard to say that it did anything good in terms of revitalizing public fishing. With the CPV is low in the FMA, and the total yield, that's in an open year, so it's half that over the cycle, is very, very low by uh, any normal standard. Now, it's hard to work out whether that number is super reliable. It's difficult to measure return on number of people spearfish and so on. But even if that number was three times as high, there's still not a lot of catch coming out of that area. So um, at least in my opinion, anyone anyway, is entitled to their interpretation. But I, I, I find it very hard to say that there's any way that the FMA has been effective. So just to sort of uh, ignoring the FMA for now, uh, the Waikiki FMA, the general question is, you know, uh, Waikiki is a terrible area, and it's a tough place to do anything, and there's no question that habitat decline has occurred over the time. So, you know, it's by no means the end of the story about whether a rotational area could work, because it obviously hasn't worked in Waikiki. And, but, so, more broadly, the question is, would it, you know, how realistic is it for coral reef areas in Hawaii? And I think what a lot of people don't appreciate is that many reef fish have very long lifespans. Surgeon fish generally live 30 or more years. Uh, jacks, a dozen plus years. A lot of fish live in a dozen or more years. A lot of them are quite slow to mature. And that means they grow slowly. They have long periods of uh, in which they're sexually mature. And then often, the largest ones are the most important breeders. And all those things mitigate against much benefit accruing in a fairly short period of closure. And the exceptions to that, and there are a few exceptions. So goatfish, some of the small parrots, can actually grow quite large. Uh, can grow, they have a fairly short lifespan, three to five years. They could conceivably grow in a couple of years, enough that you would get, instead of catching very small fish, you catch a little bit bigger fish. But you're setting a very low bar if that's what you want to achieve in a you know, managed area. So just to conclude, I mean, in terms of rotational closure more generally, what might it achieve? Would it reduce effort because you're only fishing half the time? Well, that certainly didn't happen at Waikiki. We're in a situation where there's a tremendous pressure of population, it's, I think it's unlikely to happen in, in most parts of Hawaii. 
Curly rotational area provides sort of what you might consider traditional conservation functions, some kind of spillover, re replenishment, or sort of uh, spawning increase effort, um, effects. Some kind of recovery of ecological function. You get the large, important grazers, large, important fish which sort of modify the environment in beneficial ways. Or are these areas maybe more preferred by tour tourists or something? And the question, I think it's very unlikely in this case because all basically depend on the buildup of large fish, which take a long time. Uh, and so finally, you might achieve this kind of other goal, fishery biodiversity, ignoring biodiversity and conservation effort, uh, impacts, could it be a good way just to manage a fishery? And the problem really is that it's kind of axiomatic in coral reef fisheries that places can decline very rapidly when they're fished. So the decline, the period of benefit will be relatively small relative to the, to the closure period. <coughs> and then basically, because most fish are quite long-lived and slow-growing, there's very few fish where you're really going to benefit much in any way. So thank you, that's all I have. Uh, any questions? Paliku ika pa ma kani ku ma ku hakali da ohu leva iya ya kalawa haka ano oleke ya ohu no ke no ke hakala la ke ya manu ika ohu ika ohi ahama me ho ahama ida le o kalu apa ne apa ne mai pa hai ke ya mamu e.